Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Questions and Answers. Today is Saturday, August the 3rd. Yep, we're in August already. All right, just to get it out of the way, some of you are probably wondering, uh, Pete, how come you have like a different hairstyle today? And some of you may have noticed like the last like two weeks or so, my hair's looked a little odd, a little off. Well, the reason for it is that I had a little mishap with the gas grill a couple weeks ago. In fact, I think it was, was two weeks ago today uh, where we had a little fire that kind of, anyway, there were a faulty regulator, a little bit of an explosion, not much. Anyway, I lost some hair uh, right here in the front. And so I've been trying to figure out a way to, till it grows back uh, to kind of make my hair look less weird. So I decided today to do a little parting on the side type of thing. Whatever, I think I may do keep it this way for the next week or two till the hair kind of grows in because I probably lost about a good inch on just some sections like right up in here. So I've been trying to kind of make it look somewhat normal. Not easy, you know, but whatever. <laughs> anyway, now that's out of the way, let's get to some questions here because we got a, a bunch of good ones, all right? From Leaf Siklasi. Leaf writes in, thanks, Pete, for all these shows. 1969 was a great year for music with outstanding releases by The Stones, The Who, Jethro Tull, Led Zeppelin, among others. What would be your top five albums of 69? So I went and kind of took a look at like all the major releases from that year, and there's a shitload of them, right? So I want to run through some of the ones that I really like, and then I'll whittle it down to five. So you got Led Zeppelin released their first two albums, both in the same year, I think both within like five or six months from each other, Zeppelin 1 and 2. You got Tommy by The Who. You got King Crimson's in the Court of the Crimson King. You got the Chicago Transit Authority debut album. You got Stand Up by Jethro Tull, uh, Spooky Tooth, Spooky Two, Frank Zappa, Hot Rats, the first Blind Faith album, well, the one and only Blind Faith album, uh, the Allman Brothers Band debut, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival's Green River, uh, Let It Bleed by The Stones, Abbey Road by The Beatles, uh, Free, Tons of Sobs, James Gang, Your Album, Neil Young's Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere, The Doors, Soft Parade, Grand Funk Railroad, released both On Time and Grand Funk in the same year, a couple months apart, Santana's self-titled debut, Steppenwolf's Monster, Blue Cheer's self-titled debut, so all sorts of great ones. Those are probably some of my favorites. There's a lot of other ones I, haven't got, I didn't mention. My top five would have to be... Grand Funk Railroad's Grand Funk album, uh, Chicago Transit Authority, uh, The Who by Tommy, King Crimson, The Core of the Crimson King, and probably Led Zeppelin 2 or 1. <laughs> I, I like them both about equally. Probably Led Zeppelin 2, I guess. Um, so there, there's my top five. from A great year in music, though. And I was I was shocked to, to note that Hendrix did not release any albums in 69. He released two in 67, one in 68, and then, of course, we had the Band of Gypsies in the uh, 1970s. So um, nothing from him in 69. I guess he was too busy touring that year, right? Touring and writing, recording stuff, but he didn't release anything. From Bongalong. Some of the newer prog acts like the Flower Kings have been accused of padding their music by adding too much filler music. For example, the Flower Kings, the Garden of Dreams from Flower Power, clocking in at three seconds short of 60 minutes. Some may say it's just a bunch of random pieces jammed together to create an epic. I personally love the journey. What say ye, O master of all that is rock? Well, I don't know about being the master of all that is rock, but uh, I can certainly give my two cents on this. So I think a lot of the modern prog bands... Uh, who have come out like since the start of the 90s. I think that uh, obviously many of them take their cue and their influence from the greats of the 70s. So, And you had some of those greats of the 70s that were very good at writing and recording long form musical pieces, right? Or epic tracks. Okay. You know, you know, all the, all the, uh, guilty suspects, right? You know, it's supper's ready and close to the edge, so on and so forth. Tarkas, etc. Um, I think a lot of the more modern bands try to recreate that, okay? In my opinion, though, longer is not better in many cases. And there are, there are a lot of bands who have done very well with creating these long epics, okay? Flower Kings, you know, you list one here that's ridiculously long. I mean, that, that's a little crazy. Um, but the Flower Kings have done a, a lot of really good 15 to 20 minute tunes. Spock's Beard, you know, uh, there have been a lot of bands that have put together some really, you know, Transatlantic is another one. But again, it depends on the band, all right? Not every band is talented enough to piece together uh, all these little individual movements into one long epic track and make it work and make it listenable, okay? Um, I personally, as I've gotten older, I have 
less patience or tolerance for like 25, 30 minute long tracks. There are certain bands, like I said, that can do it and do it well. Transatlantic comes to mind. When Transatlantic does like an epic track like that, they usually keep me listening. All right. But there's certain bands that, you know, and there's so many of them that, they, you know, they feel like every album they've got to put like a 25 minute long song on there. You don't always have to because it doesn't always work. Right. But in, in many cases, it does. So it, I, I think it all depends on the band. And, you know, in order to make an epic length track work, you've got to hold the, the listener's attention. Uh, so that's, you know, compelling musical arrangements. Okay, you got to have some hooks in there and melodies in there, right? Um, it doesn't always work. But yeah, I just, I, f <laughs> I find like if, if a, b a band puts out an album and it's like one long 45, 50, 60 minute long track, I'm just kind of like, oof. At this point in my life, I'm like, I, I tend to shy away from that stuff. But again, certain bands can do it. Not all of them can, though. In fact, most can't. From Indie Cult 777, I went back and listened to your rant about the end of the classic rock star. I wanted to ask about the classic rock critics such as Lester Bangs, Robert Chris Gow, etc. They and other critics became somewhat stars in their own right back in the 70s and 80s. My question is, how has the field changed as the world of the rock star has changed? Well, basically, everybody's a rock critic now. That's the problem. So back in the day, you had, you know, the critics were featured, you know, in magazines and newspapers, uh, maybe on TV shows or what have you. But, you know, with YouTube and... You know, Everybody's a rock critic. So you've got like, you know, people who call me a rock critic, Eddie Trump, Eddie Trump, a rock critic. You know, there's, there's so many people who are or who have been journalists who now because of YouTube and what have you the, can voice their opinions. So the guy living down the street in his mom's basement is a rock critic now. Right. Uh, it, it's it's changed. So the same thing with how there's um, there's no more rock stars. Now you have all these anonymous critics. OK who, you know, rely on YouTube hits and YouTube followers. And that's, you know, that they don't, uh, they don't, they may not write, they may not appear on television or in, in the, the real popular media, right? But anybody can be a critic nowadays. And I don't think that the general public has the attention span to, you know, you, in the old days, you had these critics, you know, whoever they wrote for appeared on, they, you know, they had a following because people would stick with you, okay? They, they would, you know, Tune in every time this person's talking or writing. Well, nowadays, it's like everybody's a dime a dozen, and people don't have the attention span to follow someone religiously week after week, month after month, year after year. So it's just like, just like with music. People don't follow musicians and, and bands much longer than a release or two or a song or two. So it's just a, a completely different time. Here today, gone tomorrow. The attention span for of everybody is does not stick on anybody. Okay, so nobody sticks anywhere longer than a brief period of time, and you've already moved on to something else. I mean, I talk to people all the time who, uh, you know, oh, have you caught this guy's show on YouTube? It's great. I'm like, oh, cool. You know, I gotta check him out. And then I, you know, three, two, three weeks later, I check out a show. I talk back to that friend or acquaintance. I'm like, oh yeah, I checked out that that guy that you told me to about that show. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't watch him anymore. I started watching this other thing, and I'm like. You can't keep up, right? Because people just, they move from one thing to the next so quickly because we're, we live in a throwaway society, right? Everything's just good enough for one session, one meal, one visit, you know, one viewing, one read, that, that's it, and move on to something else. So from Cockney Red, I've always wondered why the mid 60s to about the mid 80s was so creative, especially in England. Who would have thought? <laughs> uh, I couldn't all be down to it couldn't all be down to social conditions and nothing else to do, right? So what caused this explosion from so many bands, artists in that era to produce such high quality music and invention? I'm 65 and live the whole thing and miss that era so much. But why is there not the same creativity today? And with all the tech advances we've had since then, I certainly think that today's offerings are vastly inferior to the to the 90s, little in the fantastic 60s and 70s. Well, I mean, let's face it, the, the, the late mid-late 60s and the 70s were pretty special, okay? I think that artists were allowed the freedom to create the music that they wanted up to a point. Uh, I think you started to see that change a little bit in the 70s. I think when record labels started to see big bucks based on radio exposure and selling hit singles, they really started to tell uh, artists, musicians, and singers uh, around the mid late six to seventies to, you know, what we got to really start honing in on selling singles and you got to write hit songs. And that became even more prevalent in the eighties, right? Every, every album had to have hit songs on it. And then every, every album had to have a song that could be featured in an MTV video, 
right? I mean, so that's what it was. Um, so I think that that uh, freedom for creativity started to become a little bit handcuffed as the 70s started to wind down and the 80s began. You know, I will say, Cockney Red, that, uh, and I get what you're saying, uh, it, it, it seems to most of us that there was so much better music back then, but let's also think about how old we were back then. That was a different time. We were all a lot younger. Uh, we didn't have the wealth of stuff that's available today. At, at seemingly, you could just, every direction of your head, there's another 50 bands you could check out. And who's got the time? Who's got the patience? So back then, you know, we really kind of saddled up to and held on to all of our favorite acts and their albums. And we just, that's what our life lives were consumed with. Fast forward now, you know, 40, 50 years or whatever. And a lot of us don't have that time. Okay, don't have the inclination to go and do the research and go find stuff. It's all out there. There's a lot of great music being produced and released these days. A lot of really good. But, you know, the vast majority of people don't want to go find it or, you know, they'll listen to it and they'll be like, ah, that's okay, but I, I, I like the old stuff I listen to better. It's because we're at a point in our lives where we're not willing to give newer music by newer bands a chance. Okay, like we were when we were that age. Okay, if we were to kind of like stop the clock and redo everything and be, be 15 years ago, 15 years old again today, I bet you you'd be saying something a little bit different. Okay, I think a lot of us fall into that trap. We hold close to heart the music of our youth for a reason because we lived it, right? Now our lives are much different. So we still hold close all the old music from back in the day, but we don't embrace anything new anymore. So I think us as a generation saying that there's no good music being produced is very inaccurate inaccurate and i'll tell you that firsthand because i do for a major hobby of mine running the website and doing this youtube channel i get exposed to a ton of new music almost every day there's a lot of good stuff out there but there's a lot of people just not willing to give it a chance and that's the problem with with the, the kind of the older generation so all of us like you know 40 45 50 and older crowd who you know have such great memories of all that stuff from the 70s and the 80s and it is great i'm not knocking it. it's the best music ever produced but are we kind of clouded because that's the era we grew up in i don't know and you couple that with the younger people of today who go, goes back to the last question who don't stay latched onto anything long enough to you know keep these bands going it's not a good it's not a winning combination no matter what way you look at you know so Still a lot of great music out there. It's ready to be ready to be you know enjoyed. It's it's there. Um, all right, what do we got here? Manny Boy Walker. Hey Pete, I've had this conversation with a few people regarding both these bands who I love, Sticks and Kansas. Both bands who have been who have replaced their lead singers. Do you think that Lawrence Gowan and Ronnie Platt are better showmen, so to speak, than Dennis DeYoung and Steve Walsh? I think both replacements are fabulous, but I, for one, think particularly that Gowan is much more of a presence on stage than his predecessor. You could possibly say the same with Journey and Foreigners, two replacement vocalists, too. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, let's face it. You know, Steve Walsh, in his younger years, was a powerhouse on stage, whether he was sitting behind the Hammond organ or up in front of the stage. I mean, he was all over the place. You know, you could say, arguably, a lot of that was fueled by cocaine, right? But... <laughs> whatever that's that's a topic for another day um i i have seen kansas with ronnie platt he does a great job you know uh he's a he's a very good singer he can sing a lot of the tunes that steve couldn't sing anymore which is great it's great to see kansas play some of those tunes dust them out of the closet uh whether he's a better front man or, or not i don't know i personally think walsh was a little more dynamic back in the day but you know ronnie's not a spring chicken either he's not you know 30 40 years old so um but i think he does a fine job you know lawrence is a hell of a front man i think quite frankly he is a little bit more mobile on stage uh he's uh you know both him and Dennis are pretty flamboyant. And, you know, I saw Dennis DeYoung and his band live a couple years ago. And for a guy, who what is he, 70 years old now? He's still, yeah, he, he does a great job up there on stage. Uh, and it, it's arguable that he's a little bit more flamboyant on stage now at his older age than he was when he was younger, where he mainly just stayed behind the keyboards, right? But, um, but Lawrence, I think, does a fantastic job. Now, as far as like Arnel Pineda from Journey, he's a great front man. He's a really good front man and a really good singer. And, you know, the problem is so many, and I get it, but so many people are, whole hook, are hooked on, 
ah, oh, it can't be Journey without Steve Perry. Well, you know what? There was a Journey before Steve Perry, okay? And there has been a Journey after Steve Perry for a long time now. And I get that he's an iconic, amazing singer, okay? And he was the voice of Journey for all those years. But, you know, sometimes life goes on. And I think people who have that kind of block that they can't accept a band without a certain member, it's like, you know, Arnell, while he does sound a bit like Steve Perry, you know, if you listen to some of the original music that Journey has created and released with Arnell on vocals, he's got his own sound and style, right? And I think he's a fantastic frontman. So I think he was probably the best choice for the role. Uh, as far as Kelly Hansen and Foreigner, he's damn good too. And I think Kelly Hansen is probably, you know, and really there's no replacing Lou Graham in his prime because he was an amazing singer and a great front man. But Kelly is a, is a front man of a different nature and he's equally really good. So I think that the point of this whole kind of question and my answer is that I think a lot of these bands have replaced their classic singers with guys who can cut the mustard big time. Okay, and, and they need to be given a chance uh, by, you know, fan, longtime fans who maybe are a little skeptical because uh, they're all they were all good choices. Not only do they sing great, they're great on stage. So from Caspar, Bylock, hey, Pete, me and Steve Harris share a love for Golden Earring. Up to this day, going strong and releasing one superb album after another, but virtually unknown in the USA, apart from Radar Love and maybe some other hit singles. The big question is why the guys themselves blame it on lack of touring. What's your take on this? Well, it could be a lack of touring. I haven't, you know, I haven't looked. I don't know how often or not often uh, Golden Earring toured here. I honestly, when I was growing up, I don't remember them coming around much at all. Uh, but they had, you know, Twilight Zone or Radar Love were, were pretty big hits for them. But um, is two enough? You know, that's the thing. And, and ironically, those are two, not two of their best songs. That's, you know, plain and simple. Golden Earring had a lot of really, really great albums. Uh, those early albums, you know, from the early mid-70s are great hard rock albums. They really are. And, you know, Radar Love and Twilight Zone <coughs> are cool tunes. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, they have a lot better songs. So maybe, you know, again, early 70s when their records were just really, really strong. Maybe they weren't touring enough. You know, Radar Love comes out, pretty big hit. You know, you know how it goes in this country, especially back in the 70s and the 80s. If, like, if you had a decent hit, you had to back it up with tours. I mean, look at look at Thin Lizzy, perfect example. You know, Thin Lizzy had broke big with uh, The Boys Are Back in Town, and then Phil got sick, they couldn't tour, you know, and their, their, their touring was very spotty in like the mid to late 70s, uh, and that really stunted their ascension here in the U.S. Probably the same thing you could say for a Golden Earring. Like I said, I don't remember them touring much here at all when I was a kid growing up. Uh, but they, you know, they had a lot of really good albums. And you know, maybe, like I said, maybe two singles just isn't enough. And if you don't back it up with tours, you're kind of forgotten. So most people, when they talk about Golden Earring, they're like, oh, yeah, the Radar Love Group. And they don't know anything else. Well, they're missing out, right? Because there's some really great material there. From Colston Veer. Hi, Pete. I wonder if you could share your experience with difficult music by which I mean music that is discordant <clears throat> or low or, or lacking in obvious melody. I am thinking of free jazz and some of the more progressive music of the likes of King Crimson and Frank Zappa. For instance, fans, sloth, nuns, felons, and lumpy gravy. Zappa was, my, excuse me, Zappa was my gateway to this kind of music, and although I don't listen to it regularly, I do like to dip in and out once in a while. What artists introduce you to such, and what bands would you recommend? Um... Well, I mean, early Frank Zappa, absolutely. You know, there's there's a lot of different eras in Frank's music. You know, you had that that early, like the 60s and early 70s stuff, which is uh, pretty avant-garde, right? Some really weird shit going on there. And Frank, you know, just really trying to... Um, he was just exploding muso musically from the inside. And uh, that early Zappa stuff, you know, it's kind of psychedelic, kind of avant-garde. It's, it's a little tough to listen to at times. I really have to be in the mood to listen to that. But then Frank went on to do, like, amazing, you know, like, jazz fusion-style music. And then he did, like, all the satirical rock and roll and, you know, the Joe's Garage era and all the 80s stuff, you know, the political satire, blah, 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 blah. Uh, not all of Zappa's music is easy to listen to. Uh, another band that I got into probably you know, about 25 years ago or so and I'm, I like them I don't love them is Henry Cow gotta be in the mood to listen to Henry Cow okay uh, how about you know the music of a couple like I guess you can call them dark prog bands but like Prezant okay and Universe Zero that's some pretty pretty out there stuff um, 
I'll bring them up again. I don't like them. I've tried to like them. They just don't do it for me is Magma. All right. That's out there big time from a musical perspective and a vocal perspective. Uh, you want to try and get into some seriously, you know, difficult music, try Magma. Uh, from a free jazz perspective, I happen to like Ornette Coleman's music. But again, that stuff is so chaotic and raucous at times. I'm just like, oof, but when I'm in the mood for that, it's nothing like it, right? Uh, the, the band Can, okay? Can't say I've warmed up to them too much. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of music like this out there that's just like, you know, it, it's, it's just really, really, like you said, difficult. It's uh, borders on obnoxious at times. It's discordant. It's, uh, you know. It, it, if you're if you're in a mood to, if you're in craving melodies you do not reach for these guys or these bands right but there 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 always comes a time where you want to put something on it's just like jagged and just you know whatever like I think of like some of the the, the more um, obscure King Crimson stuff is like that it's just so dissonant and so noisy at times but but when you're in the mood for that there's nothing like it right from Russell Gentile hi Pete. Thanks for answering all these great questions. A lot of fun to hear your insight. Can you please list your top four or five greatest decades of music and reasons why? Yes. All right, my favorite decade should come as a surprise to no one, but the 70s are great. Um, most of what I listen to or have loved all my life came from that decade. Like I said earlier, I think the, the bands in the 70s had a freedom to kind of do what they wanted. Write, this, write and record the songs that they really wanted to do. And I think that there was a uh, kind of an experimentation um, that was going on through that, throughout that decade. And just, I don't know, I don't know, you know, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what it is about the 70s that's so great. There's just like music was just like pushing the boundaries all the time, regardless of what the genre was. And there's just so much music from that era that just speaks to me big time. So uh, that's my number one. Number two is probably the 80s because again, you know, in the 80s, I'm, you know, 14, 15 years old and that for me was the decade of heavy metal, right? And that, you know, we, we've already, I've talked numerous times about what, you know, heavy metal has done for me in my life, right? That just kind of made me kind of who I am and uh, was the music of my youth and still a big part of my adult life. And I think there was just a lot of really, really great heavy metal music in the 80s, which really kind of, you know, worked well with me as an individual growing up as a teenager and into my 20s and what have you. Uh, next, I would probably go back to the 60s because I think a lot of the seeds of what I grew to love in the 70s and even the 80s came from the 60s. And I think there was just some really groundbreaking things happening in the late 60s specifically that also really speaks to me and, like I said, kind of built that core of the 70s. So, you know, acts like uh, Hendrix and The Who and Cream and The Beatles and The Doors and all that kind of stuff. Uh, just for me, it's like, you know, the great, early Grateful Dead, the Allman Brothers, all that kind of stuff. That all kind of started in the late 60s, you know, Deep Purple too, you know, Iron Butterfly, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that was, again, if it wasn't for those bands, everything that we grew to love in the 70s may not have happened. So very important. And, and lastly, uh, I'm going to, you know, the, you know, the 90s for me was kind of like a, a big void. I'm not a big fan of like the, the music of the 90s. So I'm just going to skip over that. I'm going to go to like the 2010. So like the last like nine years or so. There's a lot of really, really great music, like I mentioned before, coming out in recent years, whether you love, you know, metal or hard rock or prog or, you know, jazz or whatever. There's a lot of really good stuff happening uh, in the last like, you know, eight, nine years. And I think that, you know, when we look back on the 2010s, like maybe 10 years from now, I think a lot of people are going to finally realize that. Maybe not from a mainstream perspective, okay? Certainly not, in my opinion, from a mainstream perspective. But there's so much great music happening in the underground, so much of it, that most people just don't get to experience at all, okay? From Arnaud B., what are, what are, according to you, the special specificities of the Canterbury genre? In other words, when you listen to a record, what makes you say it's in the Canterbury style? Okay, uh, that's a great question. So for me, the music sounds really kind of British, right? There's that kind of, kind of like whimsical, kind of British quality to a lot of the bands from the Canterbury uh bands in the Canterbury style. I was going to say Canterbury era, Canterbury region, whatever. It's more of a style, right? So when I hear something and I say, oh, that's, God, that sounds like a Canterbury 
type of thing. Uh, it usually sounds kind of British. It's very quirky. Um, it's it's got a whimsical nature to it. It's not heavy music. Okay, uh, it's got kind of jazz like arrangements, but it's not too jazz. It's kind of like you know rock musicians who are trying to dabble in a little bit of light jazzy type of thing. Uh, there's usually pretty good hooks in the, in the music, whether it's all instrumental or with vocals. Um, so there's a little a bit of pop in there. Uh, sometimes there's improvisations going on in the music, but again, like I said, it's like rock musicians trying to do little bits of jazz or throw little bits of jazz in their music, but it's not quite jazz. Uh, but again, there's just some, there's a quirkiness to the Canterbury style that's pretty instantly noted, right? Um, you know, and you get, you, National Health, Hathi Le North, Matching Mole, Caravan, Gilgamesh, Gong, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Egg, all those bands, they all have that kind of like quality and then those little elements going on in their music. From Sherry Raisbeck, I know you don't like these kinds of questions, but I was just wondering if you have Tony McAlpine's Maximum Security in your collection. Uh, I don't. I used to have that on LP. Uh, in fact, I had a couple of McAlpine LPs in my collection, and I got rid of my LPs, you know, a million years ago, and I don't, I don't think I own any Tony McAlpine anything anymore. I probably should because I always dug his music. Great musician. Great musician. Got to meet him once. Really nice guy, too. From uh, Mark Williams. Hello, Pete. Great show. Always look forward to this format. Haven't submitted a question in a while. What's your take on collaborations? I'm a big fan. Iomi and Hughes come to mind immediately. Which artists would you like to see work together? Mine would be Jeff Beck and Stanley Clark do a whole album together. They've worked together on a handful of songs in the past, but a whole album would be mind-blowing. Yeah, I absolutely agree in that. Jesus, I would love to hear... Uh, Jeff and Stanley do a whole album together. Absolutely. Uh, I would like to see Iomi and Hughes do another album together. All right? Big time. I love those two guys together. On uh, the same token, I would like to see Tony Iommi work with Jordan Landy on vocals. You know, it's like I just, for me, I love Iommi with Dio, and Jordan Landy is kind of like, you know, now that Dio is no longer here, he's kind of like that guy who's got that kind of like godly voice, right? And he's obviously, you know, fairly young. Uh, I would love to see those two do an album together. You know, they played together briefly at the, the, the Dio tribute after he passed away, but I would love to see them do an album together. You know what I always thought would be a good mix too? Paul Rogers and John Sykes. I mean, John Sykes needs to do something, right? Because the guy's just, he's never going to release that fucking solo album that he's been talking about for a million years at this rate. So I would love to see him working with a, a, a real mega singer. Um, and I think Paul Rogers, I've longed to see Paul Rogers work with a guitar player, you know, another guitar player of that caliber. It's been a while. Uh, I also would love to see Paul Rogers and Joe Bonamassa do an album. Okay. Cause I'm not really sure like what, I know that uh, black country communion are probably going to do another record, but that, that just, you know, they do a record, they do a couple shows and that's it. Cause Joe's so busy, but I would love to see him and Paul Rogers do a record together. I think that would be great. Uh, I'd love to see like Steve Morse and Derek Sherinian do an instrumental album together. You know, maybe with a great drummer, maybe someone like Billy Sheehan on bass. Would love that. Uh, I always wanted to see, you know, he's obviously not with us anymore, but I always wanted to see Ronnie James Dio and Ingve do something together. And now that Ronnie's not here, I would love to see Ingve and Jorn Landy do something together. Be kind of cool, right? I mean, you, you can come up with so many of these collaborations, uh, you know, love to see type of scenarios. From Kevin D., Pete, I've heard, you, I've heard you mention how fond that you are a lot of old Southern rock. Are there any newer Southern rock bands that you would like or would recommend checking out? What about Blackberry Smoke? I was skeptical at first thinking that they sounded too country, but then I saw them live and started checking out their albums. I'm a big fan now. Yeah, I mean, you're going to hear about a lot of this stuff on the uh, History of Southern Rock show that I'm doing hopefully in the next couple of weeks. But uh, Blackberry Smoke are a very good band. Um, Blackstone Cherry are a great modern Southern rock band, a little on the heavier side, but really, really good. Uh, the Marcus King Band who I'm just really starting to get into lately, are excellent, okay? If you like uh, like classic Allman Brothers type of thing with a little bit of Government Mule, got throw a Government Mule in there as well. Uh, a Thousand Horses are a very talented band, as well as Whiskey Myers. So there's a lot of really good modern Southern rock bands. Again, probably too many to even mention because they're, they're all over the place. But uh, I'm going to try and cover as many as possible in my History of Southern Rock show when I get down to doing that. From Thomas Sharpless. Like you, I am a huge UFO fan. Inspired by your top 10 lists, I recently was trying to put together a mental list of my top 10 UFO songs of all time. Though Shanker is my all-time favorite guitar player, I was surprised at just how many Paul Chapman songs made my list over many of the more legendary Shanker tunes. My question is, what's your take on the Paul Chapman era? 
while a much sloppier player than Michael, his playing really had an impact on those early UFO albums. Your thoughts? I mean, I like Paul Chapman as a guitar player, like you. Uh, I don't like him nearly as much as I like Shanker, but I think Paul was very instrumental in helping the band kind of recoup and move into the 80s after Shanker left, right? And those albums, you know, No Place to Run, The Wild, The Willing, and The Innocent, and Mechanics are pretty strong, you know? I think, you know, for my money, No Place to Run, I think, has some really strong songs, but I just, I don't like the production. I think that the, the, that album should have been a little heavier. It's a little too slick for me, okay? Mr. Martin's production, you know, and I know he was a legend, but I don't think he was the best guy to work with, uh, with UFO. But The Wild and Willing and the Innocent is a great album. Mechanics is very strong, too. And I like Paul's work in uh, Lone Star, if you haven't heard the Lone Star stuff, which is his band that he was in prior to joining UFO. Really good. From Jamie Laszlo. Over the course of music, there have been non-metal songs covered by hard rock metal bands. For example, Marilyn Manson covered Sweet Dreams Are Made of This, and Metallica covered Turn the Page, and we can go on and on and on about all the cool kind of uh, metal covers of non-metal songs. Uh, if you were in a metal band and had to cover a non-metal song, in your opinion, what song would translate best, and what style of metal would you use for the song? For me, I think a goth metal version of Donovan's Hurdy Gurdy Man would sound awesome. The question is a thinker, I know. Uh, yeah, it actually did make me think. And, and, you know, I probably could do a whole show on this topic. Uh, but the first thing that kind of came to my mind is I think I would love to hear, if I was in a band and wanted to do like a cool cover of a kind of like a pop tune or whatever, I would love to do like a progressive metal version of Toto's Rosanna. Because I think you could do all sorts of cool stuff with like, you know, crazy guitar solos and heavy riffs and synthesizers and all sorts of cool stuff and turn like the final, you know, the ending of the song, which on the original has got like this great, you know, jazzy Lukather guitar solo. And you could do like a blazing back and forth, you know, guitar and keyboard trade off type of thing. I think you could have a lot of fun with it. Um, and I just think even, you know, even doing like a power metal version or a thrash metal version of Roseanne, I think would be a hell of a lot of fun. I just think it's a cool tune. And I think uh, you could do a lot of things with that. Great question. From Amadeo Eichberg, Black Sabbath Dream. Band shows up on your birthday to play your backyard in mid-90s, bringing all five, all five singers. Ozzy, Dio, Ian, Glenn, and Tony all will perform only one song from their time with Black Sabbath. What would you choose for the five-song birthday set list? Very simple. Snowblind with Ozzy singing. Heaven and Hell with Dio singing. Hotline with Ian Gillen singing. In for the Kill with Glenn Hughes singing. And When Death Calls with Tony Martin singing. I would be completely happy with that. From Raymond, great, so great, great question. From Raymond Kaiser, Pete, do you feel there are bands or artists who literally came out at the wrong time or era, either too early or too late, and that they had caught the wave, so to speak, might have become bigger? All right, I'm going to combine your question, Raymond, with a Vols fans '90 question. Uh, you both basically asked the exact same question. Uh, Vols asked, Hi, Pete, there are a few very good modern bands who have had that old-school 70s hard rock metal sound, but that style just doesn't seem to get as much attention these days, which is a damn shame. Are there any recent bands that you feel would have been superstars had they gotten their start a few decades prior? Okay, so both of these questions are very, very similar. So I personally think, and they're getting popular, but it's just taken them way too long, and they should be enormous. I think Rival Sons if they had come out like in the 70s or the early 80s, would be an enormous band. Uh, they just, they've got all the tools, they've got the songs, they've got the look. There's everything about them just screams, you know, these guys are rock stars, these guys are, you know, who we would have worshipped at the rock star, you know, podium back 30, 40 years ago. And they're still, you know, like a fairly unknown band to the masses. It's a shame. Uh, other bands that I think would have been, you know, big back in the 70s, you know, Lucifer, all right, Graveyard, a lot of those those Swedish bands, Sienna Root, okay, um, I think Inglorious from the UK, another really good, like, melodic hard rock band, great songs, just, you know, what's the deal, right, uh, Cats in Space, who kind of have elements of, like, ELO and Super Tramp and, you know, that sort of thing, really good kind of, like, uh, art, art rock with a lot of pop, you know, that sort of, you know, would have, they would have been huge back in the day. Great hooks, great tunes, right? And quite frankly, you know, I know these are mo these are older guys, but Black Black Country Communion. Could you imagine if those dudes got back, got to get, you know, form that type of band back in, you know, like 74, 75, 77? They would have been huge. 
even in the 80s. So there's a lot of them. Like I said, we could do a whole show on that. There's just so many bands, and that's one of the reasons why I like the, the last you know 10 years in music, because you have a lot of bands who are they're revisiting those decades where music was at its height, and they're creating music like that, in that style, okay? Paying homage to the 60s and 70s and the 80s. But because, uh, and I think uh, questions going to be kind of, questions coming up next. You got a lot of people who the, the mainstream who just you know they listen to whatever's popular, whatever's force fed them. So that leads us to uh, Eric Ornella's question. Uh, one type of music that I have always had difficulty appreciating is super commercial music that exists solely to sell units and make money. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. Uh, usually it's a lowest common denominator copy of something that previously found a certain level of success. It's music that gets recorded due to a business decision made by record label executives. Sometimes it's made by a band that's desperate and they sell out. It could be an attempt to be part of a trend, but it's always about trying to cash in. And as far as I'm concerned, it has no heart or soul. Plus, that type of commercial music is boring as hell. I guess my question is, why do people go for it when there's music just as, just as available for the same or less money that is clearly far superior in every way? All right. I mean, that's a fantastic question, and it parlays off of the last question very well. Um, I think, I don't think I know, that the general public, when it comes to music, have gotten very lazy, okay? Nobody wants to do any of the work to find music that will really appeal to them. Instead, they want to be spoon-fed either what's playing on the radio, what's playing on the satellite, what's playing on Spotify. Uh, you know, I mean, a perfect example. It's like, you know... A lot of these streaming music services, they will recommend stuff to you. <clears throat> okay, so if you, you know, you put in, you like, uh, you know, Mars Volta or Leonard Skinner or Bruno Mars or whatever, they'll, they may, it'll recommend similar type artists. So you're basically leaving it up to someone else to tell you what to listen to. All right. I don't know about you, but most of my life, nobody ever told me what to listen to. All right. I would, I do the research. I do the work. I take chances on things. And, uh, and it's basically, it's always my decision on what I listen to. All right. You know, granted doing what I do with the website and here, I get sent a lot of music to check out, but still I'm, I'm going and I'm doing the work and I'm listening to all of it. Right. Some I like, some I don't like, but there's a lot of people that just, you know, they, they just refuse to do that. And it's like, you know, Oh, you know, it's, uh, this song is constantly playing on the radio. Yeah, I like that. That's pretty cool. You know, you'll, and then two months later, you've forgotten about that song. And it's just people latch on to whatever's being force fed them by the media. Okay. Whatever the, whether it's social media, radio, satellite, you know, YouTube, whatever. And it's like, oh, you know what? That, that song by that guy has got like 2 million hits on YouTube. That must be great. Let me go listen to that. Okay. It's like, but you're right. It's like it's 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 the flavor of the month. Oh, this guy appeared on the Grammys. Oh, that's a great song. I love that song. Oh, how's the album? Oh, I don't know. I just know the song. It's it's just a, it's a different time now, and people just don't have the attention span to you know go find music as Eric says is clearly far superior. All right, to them they don't care about that. There's so many people. I, I talk to people all the time who. They don't know who sings the songs they like. They don't know when it was recorded. They don't know who plays on them. They don't know, did it come from an album? Is it a part of a soundtrack? They don't know and they don't care. They're just like, ah, whatever I hear, you know, I like. And, if I, and that's why I listen to. I don't know nothing about nothing. I just, and so to a lot of people, again, it goes back to something we said earlier, we're, we live in a throwaway society and music has become a throwaway commodity. That's the sad truth. That's why half, not even half, more than that, probably 90% of the musicians out there uh, can't make a living creating music. They just can't do it because people, because music has become throwaway just like everything else that we do. And, you know, there was a day where people got paid, you know, well creating music that made a, made a difference to us as consumers, as individuals. It's kind of, it's kind of different now. It's really different. I know so many people are just like, you know, they don't want to pay for music. They just, yeah, whatever, whatever's out there, it's free. I'll listen to. And, you know, it's just like, oh, that's, you know, musicians are, uh, they're, you know, they're creative people. And it's just a shame that they don't get either reimbursed or respected for, for their efforts anymore. You know, some do, but, uh, you know, there's a lot more to music than who's, you know, walks down the red carpet at the fucking Grammy Awards, right? So, um, yeah, 
great question. A lot of great questions today. So, uh, you know, as, as you can tell, I, as, as someone who works with a lot of people in the music industry, uh, I've become very disheartened over the last bunch of years of kind of where it's at now. And, you know, it's really, it's really tough when you're talking to people and you have friends who are musicians and trying to make, make a living out of it and they just can't do it. And they're just so frustrated and exasperated, you know, and then meanwhile you listen to the stuff that they do and you're like, holy cow, this person is so talented. It's like, you know, why is the rest of the planet not listening and not giving a shit, right? It's tough. It's really tough. Um, especially, you know, if you're someone who kind of grew up when people really cared about that stuff. Okay, and people were would give back to the people creating the music. It just doesn't happen anymore. I don't think anybody cares. Well, some people care, obviously. People watching the show care. That's why. That's why we have these discussions. But um, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. So anyway, visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube every day. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, all the views and, and great comments and feedback this week on not just uh, the questions and answer show but everything else we've been doing so we've had a, a real increase in subscribers and views and uh, it's great to see I'm glad you guys are liking a lot of the different shows we're doing here uh, my challenge is just trying to keep up with all of it so uh, be patient with me I'm trying to do as much as I can I know a lot of you really want more history of shows and they you know haven't been able to do many of them lately so I've been doing stuff that takes a little bit less time to do uh, but we'll get there we'll get there um, I got a lot of stuff on my to-do list so uh, we'll tackle it all as it comes and uh, we got some guest stars lined up for uh, the next couple weeks so we'll uh, see how that turns out and uh, we'll see you guys real soon all right take care bye-bye